Chapter Four of Insect Adventures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. InterfaceAudio.com. Insect Adventures by Jean Henri Fabray. Selections from the Alexander T. Sierra de Matos translation. Retold by Louise Seymour Hasbrook. Chapter 4 Bees, Cats, and Red Ants. I wished to know something more about my mason bees. I had heard that they knew how to find their nests, even if carried away from them. One day I managed to capture forty bees from a nest under the eaves of my shed, and to put them one by one in screws of paper. I asked my daughter, Agle, to stay near the nest and watch for the return of the bees. Things being thus arranged, I carried off my forty captives to a spot two and a half miles from home. I had to mark each captive with a mixture of chalk and gum arabic before I set her free. It was no easy business. I was stung many times, and sometimes I forgot myself and squeezed the bee harder than I should have. As a result, about twenty of my forty bees were injured. The rest started off in different directions at first, but most of them seemed to me to be making for their home. Meanwhile, a stiff breeze sprang up, making things still harder for the bees. They must have had to fly close to the ground. They could not possibly go up high and get a view of the country. Under the circumstances, I hardly thought when I reached home that the bees would be there. But Agle greeted me at once, her cheeks flushed with excitement. Two, she cried. Two arrived at twenty minutes to three, with a load of pollen under their bellies. I had released my insects at about two o'clock. These first arrivals had therefore flown two miles and a half in less than three quarters of an hour, and lingered to forage on the way. As it was growing late, we had to stop our observations. Next day, however, I took another count of my mason bees and found fifteen with a white spot as I had marked them. At least fifteen out of the twenty had returned, in spite of having the wind against them, and in spite of having been taken to a place where they had almost certainly never been before. These bees do not go far afield, for they have all the food and building material they want near home. Then how did my exiles return? What guided them? It was certainly not memory, but some special faculty which we cannot explain. It is so different from anything we ourselves possess. My Cats The cat is supposed to have the same power as the bee to find its way home. I never believed this till I saw what some cats of my own could do. Let me tell you the story. One day there appeared upon my garden wall a wretched-looking cat, with matted coat and protruding ribs, so thin that his back was a jagged ridge. My children, at that time very young, took pity on his misery. Bread soaked in milk was offered him at the end of a reed. He took it, and the mouthfuls succeeded one another to such good purpose that at last he had had enough and went, paying no attention to the puss-puss of his compassionate friends. But after a while he grew hungry again, and reappeared on top of the wall. He received the same fare of bread soaked in milk, the same soft words. He allowed himself to be tempted. He came down from the wall. The children were able to stroke his back. Goodness, how thin he was! It was the topic of conversation. We discussed it at table. We would tame the tramp. We would keep him. We would make him a bed of hay. It was a most important matter, I can see to this day. I shall always see the council of rattleheads deliberating on the cat's fate. They were not satisfied until the savage animal remained. Soon he grew into a magnificent tom. His large round head, his muscular legs, his reddish fur flecked with darker patches reminded one of a little jaguar. He was christened Ginger because of his tawny hue. A mate joined him later, picked up in almost similar circumstances. Such was the beginning of my series of gingers, which I have kept for almost twenty years, in spite of various movings. The first time we moved we were anxious about our cats. 
we were all of us attached to them and should have thought it nothing short of criminal to abandon the poor creatures whom we had so often petted to distress and probably to thoughtless persecution the shes and the kittens would travel about without any trouble all you have to do is put them in a basket they will keep quiet on the journey but the old tomcats were a serious problem i had two the head of the family and one of his descendants quite as strong as himself we decided to take the grandfather if he consented to come and to leave the grandson behind after finding him a home my friend dr l'oreal offered to take the younger cat the animal was carried to him at nightfall in a closed hamper hardly were we seated at the evening meal talking of the good fortune of our tomcat when we saw a dripping mass jump through the window the shapeless bundle came and rubbed itself against our legs purring with happiness it was the cat i heard his story the next day on arriving at dr l'oreal's he was locked up in a bedroom the moment he saw himself a prisoner in the unfamiliar room he began to jump about wildly on the furniture against the window panes among the ornaments on the mantelpiece threatening to make short work of everything mrs l'oreal was frightened by the little lunatic she hastened to open the window and the cat leapt out among the passers-by a few minutes later he was back at home and it was no easy matter he had to cross the town almost from end to end he had to make his way through a long labyrinth of crowded streets among a thousand dangers including boys and dogs and lastly and this perhaps was even harder he had to pass over a river which ran through the town there were bridges at hand many in fact but the animal taking the shortest cut had used none of them bravely jumping into the water as the streaming fur showed i had pity on the poor cat so faithful to his home we agreed to take him with us we were spared the worry a few days later he was found lying stiff and stark under a shrub in the garden someone had poisoned him for me who it was not likely that it was a friend there was still the old cat he could not be found when we left our home so the carter was promised an extra two dollars if he would bring the cat to us at our new home with one of his loads on his last journey with our goods he brought him stowed away under the driver's seat i scarcely knew my old tom when we opened the moving prison in which he had been kept since the day before he came out looking a most alarming beast scratching and spitting with bristling hair bloodshot eyes lips white with foam i thought him mad and watched him closely for a time i was wrong he was merely bewildered and frightened had there been trouble with the carter when he was caught did he have a bad time on the journey i do not know what i do know is that the very nature of the cat seemed changed there was no more friendly purring no more rubbing against our legs nothing but a wild expression and the deepest gloom kind treatment could not soothe him one day i found him lying dead in the ashes on the hearth grief with the help of old age had killed him would he have gone back to our old home if he had had the strength i would not venture to say so but at least i think it very remarkable that an animal should let itself die of homesickness because the weakness of old age prevented it from returning to its former haunts the next time we move the family of gingers have been renewed the old ones have passed away new ones have come including a full-grown tom we put them into baskets the tom has one to himself so that the peace may be kept the journey is made by carriage nothing striking happens before our arrival when we let the mother cats out of their hampers they inspect the new home explore the rooms one by one with their pink noses they recognize furniture they find their own seats their own tables their own armchairs but the surroundings are different they give little surprised meows and questioning glances we pet them and give them saucers of milk and by the next day they feel quite at home it is a different matter with the tom we put him in the attic where he will find plenty of room for his capers we take turns keeping him company we give him a double portion of plates to lick from time to time we bring some of the other cats to him 
to show them that he is not alone in the house we do everything we can to make him forget the old home he seems in fact to forget it he is gentle under the hand that pets him he comes when called purrs arches his back we have kept him shut up for a week and now we think it is time to give him back his liberty he goes down to the kitchen stands by the table like the others goes out into the garden under the watchful eye of my daughter aglay who does not lose sight of him he prowls all around with the most innocent air he comes back victory the tomcat will not run away next morning puss puss not a sign of him we hunt we call nothing oh the hypocrite the hypocrite how he has tricked us he has gone he is at our old home so i declare but the family will not believe it my two daughters went back to the old home they found the cat as i said they would and brought him back in a hamper his paws and belly were covered with red clay and yet the weather was dry there was no mud the cat therefore must have swum the river and the moist fur had kept the red earth of the fields through which he had passed the distance between our two homes was four and a half miles we kept the deserter in our attic for two weeks and then we let him out again before twenty-four hours had passed he was back at his old home we had to leave him to his fate a neighbor out that way told me that he saw him one day hiding behind a hedge with a rabbit in his mouth he was no longer provided with food he had to hunt for it as best he could i heard no more of him he came to a bad end no doubt he had become a robber and must have met with a robber's fate these true stories prove that cats have in their fashion the instinct of my mason bees so too have pigeons who transported for hundreds of miles are able to find their way back to their own dovecot so have the swallows and many other birds but to go back to the insects i wish to find out if ants who are insects closely related to the bees have the same sense of direction that they have the red ants among the treasures of my piece of waste ground is an ant hill belonging to the celebrated red ants the slave hunting amazons if you have never heard about these ants their practices seem almost too wonderful to believe they are unable to bring up their own families to look for their food to take it even when it is within their reach therefore they need servants to feed them and keep houses for them they make a practice of stealing children to wait on the community they raid the neighboring ant hills the home of a different species they carry away the ant babies who are in the nymph or swaddling clothes stage that is wrapped in the cocoons these grow up in the red ant's house and become willing and industrious servants when the hot weather of june and july sets in i often see the amazons leave their barracks of an afternoon and start on an expedition the column is five or six yards long at the first suspicion of an ant hill the front ones halt and spread out in a swarming throng which is increased by the others as they come up hurriedly scouts are sent out the amazons recognize that they are on a wrong track and the column forms again it resumes its march crosses the garden paths disappears from sight in the grass reappears farther on threads its way through the heap of dead leaves comes out again and continues its search at last a nest of black ants is discovered the red ants hasten down to the dormitories enter the burrows where the ant grubs lie and soon come out with their booty then we have the gates of the underground city a bewildering scrimmage between the defending black ants and the attacking reds the struggle is too unequal to remain in doubt victory falls to the reds who race back home each with her prize a swaddled baby dangling from her jaws i should like to go on with the story of the amazons but i have no time at present their return to the nest is what i'm interested in do they know their way as the bees do apparently not for i find that the ants always take exactly the same path home that they did coming no matter how difficult it was or how many shortcuts might be taken i came upon them one day when they were advancing on a raid by the side of a garden pond 
the wind was blowing hard and blew whole rows of ants into the water where the fish gobbled them up i thought that on the way back they would avoid this dangerous bit not at all they came back the same way and the fish received a double windfall the ants and their prizes as i had not time to watch the ants for whole afternoons i asked my granddaughter lucy a little rogue who likes to hear my stories of the ants to help me she had been present at the great battle between the reds and the blacks and was much impressed by the stealing of the long clothes babies and she was willing to wander about the garden when the weather was fine keeping an eye on the red ants for me one day while i was working in my study there came a banging at my door it's i lucy come quick the reds have gone into the blacks house come quick and do you know the road they took yes i marked it what marked it and how i did what hop o my thumb did i scattered little white stones along the road i hurried out things had happened as my six-year-old helper had said the ants had made their raid and were returning along the track of tell-tale pebbles when i took some of them up on a leaf and set them a few feet away from the path they were lost the ant relies on her sight and her memory for places to guide her home even when her raids to the same ant hill are two or three days apart she follows exactly the same path each time the memory of an ant what can that be is it like ours i do not know but I do know that, though closely related to the bee, she has not the same sense of direction that the bee possesses. End of chapter 4 Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com